Well, good morning. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Catherine and I'm the host for today's Charter for Compassion webinar. Today's event is the second in a series of webinars exploring topics surrounding immigration and the refugee crisis. While the social justice sector of the Charter for Compassion has the overarching mission to inspire compassionate actions in all areas of human social endeavors, the members of the Social Justice Task Force, along with partner organizations, recognize that there is a current pressing need for improved, improved holistic treatment of immigrants and refugees in the face of international crises like Syria, West Africa, South Sudan, and in the United States. In addition, we are facing a future where the impact of global climate change and population growth may increasingly affect our access to resources. We hope you agree that the time is right for increasing our awareness and understanding of compassion as it relates to global identities and human dignity. To address these concerns, we have assembled the Identity, Dignity, and Compassionate Inclusivity webinar series. The purpose of the series is to provide accurate information and firsthand accounts of the international refugee and immigration crisis. We are offering this information as a public service and in an attempt to empower individuals to make informed, compassionate, and care-based decisions regarding the treatment of all human beings. It's our hope that this individual empowerment will collectively generate a positive change in ways immigrants and refugees are welcomed to their new homes around the globe. Today, we're very excited. We have presentations by two guest speakers, Emily Crane Lynn and JC Sangoni, followed by a brief period for questions from you, our webinar participants. Just a little housekeeping <clears throat> before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please type them into the question and answer box that you can find at the side or the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to address as many questions as we have time for during the question and answer period, which will happen after both of the presentations are completed. When asking your questions, uh, please indicate if your question is for Emily, or if it's for JC, or if it's for both. It is now my privilege to introduce our first presenter, Emily Crane Lynn. Uh, Emily is the Executive Director of Canopy of Northwest Arkansas, a new resettlement agency that was established in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Emily helped found the organization out of a community-led initiative to increase refugee resettlement in her area. As executive director, Emily oversees Canopy's reception and placement program, which aims to help newly arrived refugees attain self-sufficiency within 90 days of their arrival. So without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Emily. Emily. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you to all of you who are tuning in today. It's an honor to get to share my story with you and the story of my community um, and what we're doing to try to help uh, welcome refugees and equip them with all they need to build new lives in our community. Um, I have a presentation I'd like to share with you this morning, so I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, So there we go. Hopefully now you can all see my presentation um, and you can follow along. So uh, first of all, who is Canopy? Uh, we are a refugee resettlement agency partnered with the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, which is one of um, nine agencies that resettles refugees in the United States. Um, we were established in 2016, so we're brand new, um, and we really got our start, um, like Catherine said, out of a community-led initiative, um, and that's something that we think is really special and really remarkable, um, and it's central to who we are. Um, so essentially what happened was in early um, or late 2015, in the midst of kind of the height of the global refugee crisis as it was hitting the media, 
there was an increased interest in our community in being able to help refugees, um, especially when um, the Arkansas governor, our governor Asa Hutchinson, came out as one of um, about 30 governors in the U.S. Uh, saying that he opposed refugee resettlement in our state. Um, and that really riled people up. A lot of people in our community responded to that and just said, no, that's not who we are. Um, that's not what Arkansas is. We're a place of welcome. We're a community that believes in hospitality is one of our core values. And we want refugees to come to Arkansas. We want them here and we want them to succeed here. Um, and so there was this growing movement of people that was saying these things and feeling these things, but there actually wasn't a way for refugees to get to Arkansas. We didn't have um, a refugee resettlement agency um, based here. Um, and so without an agency in our community, there was no way for refugees to come here. Um, and so this group of our group, we were maybe 50 or 60 people. Um, we started just kind of getting organized and researching what it would take to start our own agency in Fayetteville. Um, and so we worked closely with the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service and we established Canopy um, in January of last year. Um, and we were officially recognized by the State Department as a resettlement agency um, last October. Uh, so we're coming up on our very first year in existence. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of how we got our start. Our mission is that we are a group of Northwest Arkansas residents who want to see our region become a center for refugee resettlement, where refugees are welcomed and provided with all they need to build a new life. Um, and so we see our mission as kind of having several different components. The first is for the, the region to become a center for refugee resettlement. So we want to cultivate a um, community-wide interest in, um, in refugees. We want to cultivate community-wide compassion for this plight. And, um, and that's, that's a big ambitious goal, we realize that, but that is our mission. That is what we are setting out to do, is to make this something um, part of what defines us as a community. Um, so that's the first part of our mission. Um, the second part is to be a community where refugees are welcomed. Um, so for there to be that sense of welcome and, and compassion and then but there for there to also be um, providing equipping um, for refugees to be able to build new lives. So that means making sure that refugees are connected to all the resources that they need um, to be able to pursue the goals and ambitions that they have for themselves here in, in our community. So, who is it that we serve? Um, I think that the term refugee gets thrown around a lot these days. We talk a lot about it, but maybe not everybody knows exactly um, what constitutes a refugee, how we define a refugee. And I think that it's very important for everybody to know um, what our government means when we talk about refugees and what our global community means when we talk about refugees. Um, so the definition that we're all using is as follows. Um, a refugee is a person who is unable or unwilling to return to his or her home country because of a well-founded fear of persecution due to race, religion, political opinion, membership of a particular social group, or national origin. So there's a couple components to this definition that are important um, for everybody to, uh, to pay attention to. The first is that the person has to be unwilling to return to their home country, which means that they have to have left the borders of their country to be considered a refugee. So the United Nations estimates that there are approximately 65 million people worldwide who are displaced, uh, who have been driven from their homes and their cities and their communities by conflict and violence and persecution. Um, but only about 22 million of those actually qualify as refugees because only 22 million have actually crossed the border and gone into a second country. Um, so that's the first thing. We were talking about people who have actually left their country of origin and have traveled to a second country. Um, but the second important point is that um, this, in order to be considered a refugee, you have to not only um, be fearing for your life, you have to be fearing for your life because of your identity, because of who you are. So it's not enough for there to just be um, bombs raining from the sky 
you have to be, there have to be bombs falling on your neighborhood because your neighborhood is a rebel held neighborhood or because your neighborhood is a Sunni neighborhood or because your neighborhood is um, a, a Tutsi neighborhood or whatever the case might be. Um, you have to be persecuted in some way because of who you are in order for you to make that refugee claim. So it is a very narrow definition. There are a lot of people in the world who have very good reasons for migrating, for moving around from place to place and country to country, but the vast majority of them do not fit this very narrow definition of a refugee. So it's important for us to know what we're talking about when we talk about refugees. A couple basic facts, um, and this is US centric uh, because I'm in the United States. I know there are people tuning in from all over the world. Um, but so as I said, there are about 20, uh, 21 million um, refugees in the world today, the UN estimates. Um, the United States took in 85,000 of these in 2016. Um, and we were projected, we were hoping to take in 110,000 in 2017. Um, in this current year. Um, however, um, due to some changes in the political climate, um, we're no longer on track to resettle 110,000 this year. I think that we're currently at about 50,000, and I don't think that we're expected to receive a whole lot more um, throughout the rest of this year. So I think that we're probably going to land somewhere between 50 and 60,000 for this year. Canopy in Northwest Arkansas in our first year, we were originally projected to receive 100 individuals. So playing a very small part um, in this work, uh, but that was eventually reduced to 50 individuals um, as a result of the, the changes in, uh, in the political environment. Um, but nonetheless, uh, just for some context in our community, part of what makes this feasible and um, successful is that we actually have a lot of people moving to our region already. Um, we're a very fast growing part of the United States with about 31 people moving here every day. Um, and so what we're attempting to do is to just kind of um, use the momentum that's already happening in our community um, and, uh, and, and, and use that to, to kind of bring refugees in in the midst of a whole lot of migration and movement that's already happening. So real quick, I just wanted to go over the process by which a refugee comes to our community. Um, and I know that JC is going to go into this in a bit more detail, so I won't, I won't focus too much on this. Um, but essentially, the first step is refugees have to leave their homeland. Um, like I said, they have to get outside the borders of their home country. Um, and then the next step is they have to seek protection um, with the authorities in the country that they flee to. And a lot of times in a lot of uh, developing countries, um, the United Nations um, oversees the process of providing protection to asylum seekers and refugees. Um, and so oftentimes the UN sets up um, camps where refugees can kind of set up a temporary uh, living situation. Oftentimes, though, it's not all that temporary. Um, the United Nations estimates that uh, the average wait for most cases is 17 years. Um, and I realize that that is a shocking statistic. And when I first heard it, I thought it sounded inflated or it was exaggerated. People were playing with the numbers. But um, in my short tenure as executive director of a resettlement agency, the vast majority of the families that we have resettled have had um, wait times of about that that period about that length. Um, with the exception of a couple of families who came through Europe who waited more like four years, um, all of our families have had waits of, yeah, 14, 15 years. We had one family that waited for 20 years. So um, this is not exaggerated. It's, it is appalling, um, but it is not exaggerated. It is accurate. Um, but in any case, uh, after you've had your time of waiting in a camp, um, at some point your case gets reviewed and if it is determined that you do fit the definition of a refugee, then the United Nations tries to figure out um, what they can do from there. Um, so uh, there are three different options. Um, one, they might send you back to your home country if, if that is an option. Um, perhaps after 17 years, the conflict has ended or there's been a change of regime or a change of policy and it might be safe for you to reintegrate back into your home community. So if that's an option, then great. 
Um, the second option they consider is that you might be able to stay where you are um, and integrate into the country that's been hosting you. Or the third option is that if neither of those are possibilities, then they consider resettlement, which is where they work with a partner country um, to uh, essentially help the refugee integrate and build a new life in a third country. Um, so the U.S. is one of only a handful of countries that participates in the resettlement program. Um, and uh, we are uh, a leader globally. Uh, even as we're seeing our numbers go down, we continue to take in more refugees uh, than any other country through the resettlement program. Um, it is, however, a very rigorous process to get into the United States as a refugee. Once you are referred uh, from the UNHCR, essentially everything that you have taken pains to prove to them, you then have to prove to the United States Immigration Service. Um, and so that whole process takes about two years um, to first of all, double check that you are in fact a refugee according to um, the United States definition. Um, and then <clears throat> to make sure that you don't have pose any security risk in any way. So there's round after round of rigorous um, security uh, vetting interviews and checks um, even health screenings to make sure that you don't have any communicable diseases that could be dangerous um, to the United States. Um, and so that whole process takes about two years and really the stars really have to align for you to be able to then eventually get on a plane to come to the United States. Um, but if you make it through that whole process um, and you manage to get all your security checks and your health screenings to all line up, um, then uh, you're allowed to get on a plane. Um, and in that process, the United States then hands your case off to one of its nine partner resettlement agencies who basically have contracts with the State Department to provide services to refugees once they've arrived in the United States. Um, and so um, the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service is one of those uh, partner agencies. And so if they receive a case that they think might be a good fit for Fayetteville, Arkansas, and then they send them to Canopy, they send them to us. Um, and so what I'd like to um, you know, finish by sharing with you all is talking a little bit about what it is that we do you know, um, here in Fayetteville to make sure that this is a community that is welcome and eager to receive refugees. I and mean, I think that um, this is, I've learned a lot in our first year about what it means to, um, to bring people together around a, a social justice issue. Um, and I think that um, we've been pretty successful in our community in depoliticizing the refugee crisis um, so that people, even though we are a very conservative community, um, we overwhelmingly voted for Trump, we overwhelmingly vote Republican, um, we've nonetheless been able to remove this issue from the context of the political polarization and make it just a human issue and a compassion issue. So I wanted to share with you all a little bit about that. Um, so first of all, um, I've come to the conclusion that I think compassion is instinctive. And maybe this is because I'm young and naively optimistic, but I do think that all humans are instinctively compassionate um, for the most part. Um, people are inclined to have compassion for most of the social justice issues that we are encountering today, including the immigration and refugee issues. Um, I think that what turns people off um, is are other things. They, they get turned away before they have the chance for that compassionate um, instinct to ignite and to take hold. Um, so I think often um, this happens for a couple different reasons. Either they link um, the social justice issue to other partisan issues, or they identify it as being a part of a broader political agenda that they don't agree with, um, or they feel like um, the issue because of that would be at odds with their political identity, their assumed political identity, or just because we've allowed the, the issue to become so mired in partisan language that um, it's impossible to talk about it without it being, uh, you know, aggressive or, or kind of... So what I've concluded is that um, to cultivate compassion, 
we need to move the conversation out of the partisan realm and we need to try to unlink the issue from broader partisan part of politics and that's kind of what we've been trying to do here in Fayetteville in a couple different ways. So the first way is um, by shifting the narrative. Um, and so this is a chart that maybe some of you have seen. I did not invent it, um, but it's, uh, the, it's called the political parables. Um, and essentially, it's, this is a way to understand, um, it's a way that people understand the world around them through stories. And so, uh, Everything that we consume, all the media that we consume, um, all the the way that we understand um, our world is really through stories that are being told to us and that we are telling ourselves. And um, there's you can kind of break down almost all the stories that we hear into four different types of narratives. So um, there's at the, the the top left corner there. There's um, the, the triumphant individual. So there's the story about one person who um, works really hard and becomes successful. Um, and that can be kind of inspiring. Um, there's also the story of the rot at the top. So the few people who are, ex you know, conspiring to exploit the many. And that can also, you know, that, that can instill fear and can instill a strong response in people. Um, in the bottom right corner, there's the narrative of the mob at the gates, so of the masses coming together to try to overthrow us and take us take over our country. So that's a story that we hear a lot when it comes to refugees and immigrants. Um, you know, those bad hombres, they're going to sneak in, they're going to rape our women, they're going to, you know, um, bomb our churches, um, all these different things, take away our freedom, change our country. Um, so there's this, that, that's a lot of the rhetoric that we hear around refugees and immigrants is comes out of that narrative of of the mob at the gates. Um, but then in the bottom left story, there's a narrative that um, that we've been using, and I think that really really works. And that's the narrative of the benign community. So in our case, like I said, this is very American centric, but it's the story of Americans of all stripes pulling together to make America better. Um, and that's the sort of story that does it it in, it elicits a positive response instead of a negative response. Um, and so if we can shift the narrative away from the mob at the gates when we're talking about refugees and immigrants in our community towards the, the narrative of the benign community, we've seen that work really well. So when we hear people, our elected officials or other leaders in our community talking about, we need to protect our borders, we need to protect our community and our children from, from that canopy group that's bringing in refugees, the way that we respond to that is by saying, well, what's really amazing is our community has just rallied around these families and helped them succeed. Um, and we give our community full credit for that. We wouldn't even be doing this if our community hadn't shown that they wanted to do this, that we wanted to do this together. And what we're doing is really amazing. Um, we're changing these people's lives and they're changing us in a really positive way. Um, and so that's, that's, one, that's one mechanism that we have. Um, then another mechanism that we have is the mechanism of shifting the frame. So um, people view the world around them through frames. Um, so they view them through stories and they view them through frames. Um, there's negative frames um, that we can use to talk about, um, you know, issues like the refugee crisis. And then there are positive frames. Um, and so what we try to do is we try to shift the conversation, shift, get people to look at the situation through a different lens. Um, so first, so if they talk about, you know, the refugee crisis in terms of them, those people, they're, they're foreign, they're different, they're dangerous. Um, we talk about it, we try to talk about it in terms of, you know, we're all immigrants. We all came from this background. We all needed refuge. Um, if they talk about it in, a, in terms of a zero sum game, you know, where, you know, when they bring in those refugees, they take jobs from our community or those kids take away resources from our schools. We try to shift it to a, a frame of, you know, we're all better together. Um, we're actually, you know, when there's more students in the schools, that means there's more money um, coming into the schools. When there's more people working, that means there's more, you know, taxes coming in. Um, and then, um, 
there's also the frame of, you know, this is risky. Um, you know, what if it goes wrong? What if, you know, there's a bad apple? Um, we try to shift it that frame from, you know, this is pragmatic. This is a good option. Um, these people have nowhere else to go and we're giving them, you know, a good place to be. Um, if, if we let those people rot in a camp somewhere, they might grow up to resent our country. Whereas if we allow them the chance to come here, um, then they could really um, uh, become meaningful contributing members of our community. Um, and then lastly, um, we try to make sure that we that we use the right arguments. We don't want to use arguments that are going to um, make the divide bigger. We want to use arguments that are going to bring us closer together. And there's a couple different types of arguments that, that really do bridge across political divides, that no matter what your political worldview is, um, you're going to respond you know, usually to one of these arguments. And the first one is just the moral argument. It's the right thing to do. Our values as our Kansans, as Christians, as Americans, whatever it is you want to go off of, you know, as humans, our values demand it. And, um, and that's something that, you know, regardless of, of your background, it's really hard um, to, to argue with the moral argument. Um, it just is. So that's a good argument to use. Um, the second is the prosperity argument. So, um, for, if, if this is not necessarily going to be beneficial in all contexts, but especially when you're talking to somebody with kind of a regional perspective or a community perspective, it's good to talk about it from, you know, just a very practical sense. This will benefit us. Um, you know, refugees are highly motivated. They're hardworking. They're entrepreneurial. They'll contribute to our economy and our community. Um, this will be a good thing for us. So if, you know, you, you start with the moral argument, this is the right thing to do, and you build on it with this is actually good for us. Um, and then you can finish with the pragmatic argument. So you're just being very practical about it. Refugees have to go somewhere. Um, they should go to communities like ours that are equipped to receive them. Let's not send them to places where they're going to fail. Let's send them to places where they're going to succeed. Our community is very well equipped to help refugees succeed. So let's let's you know just play our part in making the best out of an awful situation. Um, so those are kind of some techniques that we use um, in a very. It is. It remains a very politically charged topic, even in our community. Um, but those are kind of three tactics that we use to bridge the divide and to, to pull this, this topic out of the partisan fray and make it just about, about people. Um, so that's all I have to share with you all. Thank you so much for, um, for listening and uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Emily. Uh, wow, um, that was an incredibly thoughtful and engaging presentation and I look forward to getting back to you with some questions that are coming in from our question and answer box and our chat box. Um, I really particularly enjoyed your discussion of shifting the, the narrative and shifting the frame. So I hope we'll get back to that. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I want to remind our webinar guests that we will have time for a few questions at the end. And uh, if you could go ahead and put your questions in the question and answer box or in uh, the chat box on your screen, uh, we'll be able to get to them after our second speaker. So. Uh, our second speaker, I am privileged to announce, is JC Sangoni. She is the Matching Grant Senior Program Officer for the International Rescue Committee. She joined the International Rescue Committee uh, Headquarters Resettlement Team as the Matching Grant Program Officer in 2015. In her position, JC provides technical assistance in early employment programs and supports field offices in achieving the programmatic objectives of their economic empowerment program. The program she works with serves more than 4,800 refugees each year and helps them on their way to economic self-sufficiency. Uh, JC started with the International Rescue Committee as a refugee resettlement caseworker in Dallas in 2007 before she became a resettlement program manager for the refugee service at Catholic Charities in Fort Worth. Wow, so she has a lot of experience here. Uh, she has a JD from Texas A&M University School of Law and a BS from Texas A&M University. So thank you for being here, JC, and uh, you can take the floor. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. I'm going to try to see if I can share my screen here. Um, 
bear with me for a second. Okay, I believe that um, I believe that everybody should be able to see my screen now. Emily, please um, tell me, or, or Catherine, please tell me if that's not the case. I, I can see your screen, so hopefully Great. everyone else can. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, as as uh, Catherine mentioned, my name is JC Singani. I'm a program officer at the International Rescue Committee. And the International Rescue Committee is a humanitarian organization. Our mission is to help people whose lives and li livelihoods are shattered by conflict and disaster to survive, recover, and gain control of their lives. Um, the International Rescue Committee uh, operates both internationally and in the US. Um, we operate in about 30 countries internationally um, to help people um, who are suffering from uh, war or disaster. Um, here in the US, we have about 28 offices and our major program here is refugee resettlement. So in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about uh, refugee resettlement process. Who are refugees? Where they come from? How do they get to become refugees? And then what happens? Uh, how do they get resettled in the United States? And then what happens once they get resettled in the United States? Um, so Emily did a very good job of describing um, who refugees are um, and their definition. And I'm going to quickly go through a couple of these slides because they are um, something that she already mentioned. So um, just to give you an overview of, of refugee, of the global resettlement and refugee crisis by numbers. Um, so we have about... Um, uh, so just to, to give you a quick idea, um, about 30 countries around the world currently accept refugees for resettlement and there are about 140,000 refugee resettlement spaces made available uh, by these governments in 2016. 8% of the global refugee population is in need of resettlement and only 1% of the refugees in need of resettlement are actually ever, resettlement, ever resettled. So just to give you an idea of of what um, the, the scope of the refugee resettlement program, it is very limited and only a tiny, tiny fraction of the refugees in need of resettlement actually ever get to be resettled. Um, the United States, historically has been a global leader in refugee resettlement, uh, resettling about 3 million refugees since 1975. My organization, the International Rescue Committee, has resettled about 38,000 refugees um, since 1975. Um, so Emily already went over this, but just to give you another quick idea of the basis for um, or the grounds for being granted refugee status in the United States of America. So as Emily mentioned, you have to be persecuted and you have to be persecuted based on one of these five categories. So based on race, based on religion, based on nationality, based on belonging in a particular social group, or based on your political opinion. Um, so a refugee is designed, uh, de defined as a person who's outside their country of origin and unable or unwilling to return home because of persecution based on one of these five categories. Um, I think we hear these two terms quite a bit um, used interchangeably, so I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about what a refugee is versus what a what an asylee is. We, we hear these two terms used quite often. Um, so applicants for refugee admission are outside of the ter territory of the United States at the time of their application, while applicants for asylum are inside um, the territory of the United States or at a, at a border or port of entry at the time they apply for, for asylum status. So, but however, both refugees and asylees have to meet the same definition for refugee status. So they have to um, have suffered persecution based on one of these five categories. However, the, the difference between re refugees and asylees is refugees are overseas when they're going through the process, while asylees are either at the border or within the United States as they're going through the process. So moving on to um, talk a little bit about 
um, how the refugee crisis is addressed and, and the different actors. Um, the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR, you probably hear this quite a bit, is the organization that works with providing durable solutions for refugees across the world. And the United States uh, and the UNHCR has um, identified these three durable solutions for, for refugees. And the first one is, is um, voluntary repatriation. Um, the second one is, is local integration. And the third one um, is, is third country resettlement. So just to give you an idea, an example of current refugees from Burma who suffered persecution in Burma and then fled to either Malaysia or Thailand. Um, While well, the first option for them would be for, for the situation in, in Burma and in their particular communities to to improve so that they may return. And if that doesn't work, then uh, UNHCR's second durable solution is for, for those refugees to be integrated into the economies of, of Thailand and Malaysia, or wherever the refugee is. And if both those options don't work, then third country resettlement is, is the third option that UNHCR has as a durable solution. Um, so just to give you an idea of the need for um, for refugees, they're, they're, the need for resettlement is far greater than the resettlement slots available. Um, so basically in 2016, there are about 15 million, more than 15 million refugees worldwide that UNHCR has considered um, deemed um, in need of refugee resettlement. And in 2016, only 85,000 refugees were resettled in the United States out of those 15 million. Um, same thing in, in 2017, there are about 21 million um, refugees um, estimated worldwide in need of, of refugee resettlement. And uh, as Emily mentioned, uh, it's, uh, this year it's probably going to be about 50,000 to 60,000 of those resettled in, in the United States. So, so definitely the need uh, for refugee resettlement is far greater than, than the actual slots available. Um, so to address that, the United States has um, established somewhat of a priority system and uh, these are the three uh, priority areas. So individual referrals, so um, individuals who actually applies, uh, apply for refugee st status based on, um, based on the persecution that they themselves have suffered are, are priority one. Um, and the second priority are, are group refer referrals. So these are groups of individuals that have suffered uh, persecution based on race, based on religion, based on political opinion. And then the third option is, is family reunification. So uh, refugees uh, who are currently in the United States applying for their family members who are currently living in refugee camps overseas um, to join them in the United States. Um, I think I saw a question as to whether or not there is a, a priority system that that's based on, on family composition or how many children there are in the family or um, women versus men. And the United States does not currently have a priority system that's based on that. So the, the current priority system is based on, again, these three categories, individual referrals, group referrals, and then family reunification. There are additional ways that refugees can access um, the resettlement process. And one example of that is um, the special immigrant visa program for um, Afghani and Iraqi individuals who helped the United States Army. Um, so those individuals, we call them SIVs, special immigrant uh, visa holders um, from Afghanistan or Iraq can also access the United States refugee resettlement uh, system as well. Um, so just to give you guys an idea of, so once a refugee is identified uh, by the uh, UNHCR as uh, a refugee potentially in need of resettlement, then the refugee is um, assisted in their refugee application uh, by uh, one of these resettlement support centers. So as you can see here, this is a map of the resettlement support centers um, that are um, through 
currently established uh, throughout the world. Um, there are a couple of small resettlement support centers in Cu Cuba and Ecuador. Um, there is the resettlement support center in Austria, Vienna, and, and they typically process a lot of um, refugees that are coming out of um, Iran and, and those close areas to Iran. Um, there is a resettlement support center currently in um, Africa, in Kenya, and that is um, probably one of the largest support, uh, resettlement support centers. Um, there is one in Jordan and Turkey, mostly helping um, applicants from North Africa and Middle East. And then um, the IRC operates the resettlement support center in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, that one serves uh, refugees coming um, in, in, in um, Asia. And then there is a resettlement support center in Damak, Nepal as well. So once a refugee has been identified for a resettlement uh, in the United States, then they'll be referred to one of these resettlement support center for centers for further assistance in completing their refugee applications. Um, so I mentioned a little bit earlier the priority system, um, but in addition to the priority system for determining which refugees actually get to come to the United States this year, there is also um, established quotas for how many refugees are going to be resettled from each of these particular areas. So this is actually based on the initial original um, uh, fiscal year 2017 refugee arrivals number, which was 110,000. So we were expecting 110,000 people to be resettled in the United States at the beginning of the year. And as you can see, the overwhelming majority of those were going to be from Near East and South Asia, about 40,000, followed by Africa at about 35,000, um, and then a fewer from, from East Asia at 12,000, Latin America at 5,000, Europe and Central Asia at 4,000. So even if you qualify to be a refugee um, for resettlement to the United States, even if you are within one of those priority, you know, first priority or second priority or third priority, you may still not be able to come to the United States this year if the country has already met this quota. So um, again, this is echoing what Emily mentioned earlier that a lot of the time it takes um, two years, but but really a lot longer for a lot of refugees from certain areas, 15, 16, 17 years to actually get to be resettled in the United States. Um, I wanted to give you an overview of the refugee processing system for the United States as well. So we talked a little bit about the referral from UNHCR for application. So once a refugee, um, whether they're in, if they're in, in a refugee camp or, or outside of a refugee camps are identified and registered with UNHCR as refugees, then they're referred for an application to a resettlement support center. And then the resettlement support center Center conducts a pre-screening interview and, and multiple follow-ups interviews uh, to determine whether or not the refugee has a legitimate claim for refugee status. Remember, uh, there is a very specific basis that you have to and requirements that you have to meet um, in order to be uh, granted refugee status in the United States. Um, so once the resettlement support centers completes your, your application uh, for refugee status and they determine that you have a legitimate claim, then you're referred for multiple security checks um, here in the United States from multiple United States agencies. And those can take a long time. Um, once you have, as a refugee, have passed uh, the, the security checks, then you're referred for a, uh, uh, an interview with the UN United States Citizenship and Immigration Services for that um, application to actually be adjudicated. So you may or may not be granted refugee status by USCIS at that point based on your interview. If you are lucky enough to be granted refugee status uh, by USCIS, then um, you have to go through a medical exam um, to, um, uh, in order to proceed to the, to the next step, which is assurance. Um, so once you've passed all the steps uh, through medical exams, then, then um, the resettlement support centers will pair you up with one of nine resettlement agencies. I work with the International Rescue Committee, which is one of the resettlement agencies. Emily 
uh, works with uh, Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services, which is another resettlement um, agency. Um, and, and the resettlement agencies work together to then determine where the refugee will be resettled in the United States. Um, and, and just to give you a quick idea on how that's decided, um, if a refugee already has a, refu uh, a, a relative or a friend who's living in the United States, it's very likely that the refugee will be resettled in that particular state. Um, however, if a refugee does not have anybody um, who they know who lives in the United States, then the resettlement agencies would determine which community is better equipped to help that particular refugee become self-sufficient, and that's where that particular refugee will be resettled. And Right before they come to the United States, refugees have to go through cultural orientation. And it's an extensive process where refugees are given information on, on living in the United States, how to be safe in the United States, uh, what the cultural norms are in the United States, what the education system is in the United States, and a lot of other information on laws and, um, and norms in the United States. And so when refugees who are lucky enough to go through all of those steps get to come to the United States. and it takes at least 18 to 24 months uh, for, for a refugee to go through all of these steps. But as Emily mentioned earlier, it can take a lot longer, 15, 16, 17 years. And there may be refugees that are waiting in refugee camps for a lot longer than that. Um, just to give you an idea of um, the resettlement agencies, we have nine resettlement agencies of a network of um, 330 offices or more. And the IRC network has about 26 offices in, in this particular state. Um, and I just quickly wanted to go through a few of the programs. So once a refugee has been paired up with the IRC as a resettlement agency, um, what I wanted to go through a few of the programs and services that the IRC provides um, to refugees once they're in the United States. Um, so we provide services from the time the refugee gets to the airport um, all the way through up to five years from the time they actually arrive in the United States. Um, and we have centered our services um, into five broad outcome categories. So some of our services are related to safety. So the first priority for every IRC staff member is to ensure that clients are protected. So refugees are protected from harm once they come to the United States. So the IRC resettles approximately 10,000 refugees each year. and um, IRC staff greets all new refugee arrivals at the airports. We provide them with individual orientations. We um, accompany them to a furnished apartment that has been stocked with food and other basic necessities. From that moment onward, the IRC serves as each client's primary point of contact. We provide assistance with everything from job searches to interpretation searches to school registration procedures to local transportation options. So each client is matched with a caseworker who directly addresses clients' needs and provide referrals to partners as needed um, for specialized support. So there are a few programs that fall within that safety category. Um, the next category is health. Um, so we have observed a steady rise in the number of refugees that come with medical and mental health concerns. Um, many refugees have endured years in prison-like camp conditions. They have fled contexts where basic health care is unavailable or um, they have experienced profound physical and emotional trauma. Um, and at the same time, um, these new refugee arrivals are, are forced to grapple with a complex UL U.S. healthcare system. Um, so the uh, work of the IRC staff is to help refugees navigate the American complex healthcare system in order for them to make sure that they are receiving the appropriate healthcare, whether it's preventative care or curative care that they need. Um, going forward to education, that's another major focus area for our programs. Um, education is the ultimate empowerment tool. Um, it enables people to drive their own health and safety and their own prosperity. Um, so the IRC offices support a wide variety of educational activities, from assistance with school enrollment for the kids 
during initial resettlement to English language classes um, for adults to make sure that they have the um, English skills necessary to obtain a job and nav navigate their communities. Um, IRC also offers various after-school programs, academic coaching programs, mentoring, community, uh, computer literacy classes, and, and more. Um, economic well-being, this is my favorite area. We provide a comprehensive package of employment programs um, that include job placement and job placement assistance for all refugees who are resettled through the IRC. We can also provide programs including vocational training, resume writing workshops, interview practice sessions, um, and, and much more. And the last but not least, um, the, the last uh, category of programs is, is uh, related to power. So the IRC is committed to ensuring that our clients have control over the choices that affect their lives. Um, so um, the IRC has uh, been, um, has, has board um, immigration um, uh, certified associates throughout our uh, Board of Immigration Certified Associates throughout our IRC network to help refugees apply for adjustment of status and then uh, further later on to help refugees apply for citizenship so they uh, have the power that they need to exercise um, their, their civic re responsibilities. Um, and I think, uh, just to give you a brief idea of, of some sources where you can obtain more information um, uh, regarding refugee resettlement, specifically regarding refugee resettlement in the United States, whitehouse.gov, and I have the link here, um, is a great place to go. Um, USCIS.gov also has a lot of great information. And then um, uh, Cultural Orientation Resource Exchange, which is um, a an, uh, department or a program that's actually managed by the IRC also has some great resources on cultural orientation and refugees and I'm, I'm not sure if I went over but um, I think this was my presentation I'm happy to take any any questions uh, that may come up thank you uh, thank you JC what an incredibly informative and comprehensive um, presentation I don't know if you all can hear me um, we have time for a couple of questions and we have a few that have come in from the chat and I have a few here. So um, my uh, first question that I have that came in for Emily or JC is, would either of you be willing uh, to share a story of an individual or a family uh, that was particularly inspiring to you in the course of doing the work that you do? Um, well, sure, I can start. And Catherine, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah. Um, we lose so, Emily? Emily, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, great. Great. Um, so I, I'll just briefly go over one of the stories that's been more inspire, most inspiring to me. This is a story of a refugee from Iran um, who had suffered... Um, persecution um, on, on the basis of her for religion um, and, and political opinion um, in, in her home country. And I think the particularly inspiring story about this particular refugee is that um, she was a single mother. She, has, she had two children, a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old. And in addition to that, she, throughout her life, had suffered um, hearing impediments. So she was actually deaf and mute. So when and she was resettled by herself with no family support and no relationships in the United States, in Dallas, Texas. She was a single mother living with her 15-year-old son and her 13-year-old daughter. And it was incredibly inspiring to see how hopeful she was of her future, even though she knew that there were countless bar barriers that she had to go through to become self-sufficient, to be able to support her family, considering her, um, her, her incredibly difficult barriers. Um, she was always helpful hopeful that um, she was going to be able to support her family. She was hopeful that her children were going to go to college. And uh, years later, she actually did, uh, she did get employed with a local community organization. Um, she was actually uh, 
she she was an experienced knitter and and the community organization um, was was um, helping uh, women knit uh, as a as a social enterprise and a business and and selling those um, those for a profit so she was fully employed and uh, both her her at, at the time that that I talked to her her oldest son was was going to college part-time and working part-time as well mm -hmm. and her daughter was was continuing to go to high school so it's it's an incredibly inspiring um, story of, of somebody who has so many barriers and still was able to uh, to achieve self-sufficiency in the United States yeah thank you how about how about you Emily oh I'm glad you went first because I needed the time to try to pick one um, <laughs> We so we're still in our first year, so we've only resettled um, 53 people uh, total, um, and each of those cases, I you know gotten to to follow their story closely, and they're all really inspiring to me. But I guess um, one that I like to tell is um, a story of a young Congolese family, a husband and wife, and their two um, young children um, that. You know, they've been here since December, so coming up on um, eight months. Um, but and they, in that time, not only have both of the adults in the family found um, jobs, they've actually uh, gone on to find better jobs. Um, so they both started out working um, in uh, kind of service industry jobs, and then uh, the wife uh, went on to get hired at a preschool, and she uh, teaches. Uh, teaches at a preschool now, and uh, the husband is actually um, currently a finalist. Um, I think he's been offered a job for uh, the position of an imam at a local mosque, uh, which is something that he's very excited about. Uh, but then in addition to that, as though that were not enough, they are both in the process of starting their own business, and they've been here eight months. Um, so they're incredible. They've, uh, they've They've started a business importing um, handmade leather shoes from uh, Kenya, and um, they've been selling them in local boutiques and just uh, working with members of our community to develop their business plan and their, um, you know, create uh, marketing resources and things like that. So I think that's maybe one of our most inspiring stories um, is has been that family. Okay. Well, great. We, I think we only have time for one more question here. We're trying to wrap it up before the um, before the hour is over. Um, and the question I have uh, in front of me says, um, sorry, what, oh, so this was a question actually for Emily. Uh, what are some of the barriers, but I think it could be for both, that some of your organization has faced uh, in, the, in the current political climate? So it might take longer than a minute. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I think really the biggest barrier we face is just um, that all of our representatives are Republican. Um, everyone from our um, state senators to our U.S. congressmen, um, everybody, our governor. And there is, uh, it for better or, well, for worse, as I would say, the, the issue of refugees has become uh, very divided among party lines. And so um, that's what we're really trying to overcome here. And we're, we're seeing it work at the community level. What we need to do is make that um, translate into enough political pressure for our representatives to then be willing to do the same. Um, and in, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, all of our, you know, representatives are very willing to acknowledge that this is not, uh, this is the right thing to do, that they're proud of us for doing this. It's great work and we should keep doing it. But then um, Senator Cotton was one of, you know, the people to, the two senators to propose the RAISE Act, um, which would permanently cap refugee resettlement and, you know, really cut it down at the knees. And so um, I think that's our biggest challenge is getting our representatives to um, have the courage, the political courage to, um, pull this issue outside of uh, the way, outside of their party's um, agenda and just make it a, about what their constituents want. Um, and so in order for that, for, in order for us to make that happen, we have to make sure that we're continually organizing our community to put that pressure in ways that's going to affect change. And that's what we're trying to figure out how to do. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Um, well, unfortunately, <laughs> it looks like we're almost out of time. I know that there's a lot more questions. I know I have a lot of questions. And 
at the same time, I feel like I've learned an incredible amount this morning from both of you. So um, I just want to thank you both uh, for your time and your talent and your, your compassionate expertise around this topic. I know um, that those of you out there who have additional uh, questions might want to reach out to the Charter for Compassion, and we will uh, attempt to pass that information along to Emily and J uh, JC. I know one person asked if you could uh, share your uh, slide presentations, and that's something I'll, I'll leave you to answer uh, after, and, 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 and we can make that available if that's, uh, if that's a possibility. Um, finally, I just want to thank everyone who's participated in the webinar either as an attendee or as a presenter or as an organizer. It takes uh, a lot and there's many, many people involved in making this webinar series uh, possible. So I wanna thank you all for your hard work. Um, while the webinars are currently free for attendees, we invite you to assist the Charter for Compassion um, in providing more educational and informational webinars by going to the website, charterforcompassion.org uh, and clicking on the donate button. But in the meantime, again, I just wanna thank JC and Emily and everyone who participated in this webinar. This is a very important topic and I think that you both did a fantastic job of enlightening us um, on the process and some of the issues and concerns that we can all work towards um, improving for a better treatment of immigrants and refugees uh, in, on the globe and on the planet. So thank you both for being here and uh, thanks everyone for joining us today and we will see you next time the next Identity, Dignity, and Compassionate Inclusivity uh, series will be a panel on August 29th, and we look forward to seeing you all there. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.